Steve Galea Recordia, uh, August uh, Ta Falcha Ikeli Goyf, a uh, father not. Uh, Ismisha Declan Gallagher, Kahir the Common Star Stukish Karafina. Uh, August Hamid Galea Tnu Gamur Le Leapt, Paul Mine and Anot, Er Leachain uh, Mon Reel, Aharla Eren Octu uh, La Jalk, the mean and Nullig, uh, Emil and Egate Spiha. Um, but one of them, Falcha Fuile, a car of Muncher Karafina. Uh, Muncher Lar Kunde Tlair, Agus uh, Muncher Kunde Tlair er Fad, Agus Argarja Ta Skapia uh, Tipel Nehern, Aluin Belatlia Kunde Muyo, uh, Agus uh, Chorki Agus Achinella uh, Tipel Nehaja. And a very, very warm welcome uh, to our friends and colleagues uh, Ata Harsalia uh, who are joining us tonight from the USA, uh, from Canada and Australia. Uh, you're a very, very important part of our diaspora, and we want to welcome and greet you in the warmest possible way tonight. Uh, you're, you're really, truly present with us. Uh, so, Mila uh, Falchiroy. Uh, before I uh, introduce Paul, I'd like to um, just mention the work that has been done by the um, Mid Clare Brigade, uh, the of the, the, the commemorative um, um, committee of the Mid Clare Brigade, of whom uh, Paul is a member of the organisation. Uh, their work in um, unveiling a commemorative plaque at Monreal some time ago. Uh, it's uh, there to Konamosuhurt Dar Lechra to celebrate our heroes. So well done in that work, uh, and uh, uh, we hope you keep up the great work that you're doing. Uh, just one or two little housekeeping details in relation to tonight. Uh, please keep your uh, cameras uh, turned off. Um, anybody who wants to pass a comment or to send a question, we'll try to get it in at the end, but you'll have to send it in by email to us. So you know our email address, obviously. Uh, you've contacted us already, commonsdara21 uh, at gmail.com. Um, and so we, we'll see, we're limited overall to one hour and 15 uh, minutes. So Major Le Paul Fain, he needs no introduction to many of you. He's a Cork-based, but very much Currafin man, uh, of whom we're all very, very proud. And uh, he's left absolutely no stone unturned, or no detail left behind uh, for tonight's presentation. He has put an immense amount of work into it. And uh, I know that you're all going to uh, really, really enjoy it. So, Mila Boyakis, Falchiro, Paul, and over to you. Good morning, Declan. It's Falchiro uh, Galear, and up to you. And you're all very welcome to what used to be my kitchen and has gradually over the past nine or ten months, uh, unfortunately, become very much my office. And I suppose that's the word, world that we're living in today. Um, and I suppose I was reflecting uh, this evening on what the men of uh, 1920 who gathered in safe houses around Kilfenora uh, 100 years ago tonight, what they would have made of this technology. And um, I'm sure that they would have been amazed by it. And I think they probably would have had two questions. The first question they would have had was, how does this technology work? And the second question I think they would have had was, how can we use this technology to get up the noses of the, R R the, to, of the RIC fellas in Ennis Diamond um, and in Corrifin? Um, now, tonight's presentation is going to take about uh, 50 minutes, possibly an hour. Uh, I've actually only gone over it once in terms of timing, so um, I'm going to do my best to, uh, to stay within the time. Um, and uh, I'm going to, I suppose, I've, I've, um, Gordon Brown had some uh, uh, staffers who used to deliver bad news to him and a bad news sandwich, so he has to give a piece of good news. Uh, then a piece of bad news and then a piece of good news again. So I'm going to take the same approach tonight. Uh, the good news is that uh, good looking and all as I am, you're not going to have to look at me for the whole evening. Um, I do have, um, um, I do have uh, quite a number of slides to show you. Uh, the bad news is I have 75 slides, uh, but uh, the good news again is that there's very little writing on them and they're mainly going to be pictures that I'm going to talk through uh, and, uh, and videos that I'm going to show you. So I'm not going to take up too much time with introductions because I want to spend most of our time on the reason we're all here this evening, which is to, um, to uh, 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 I suppose, um, consider and learn about um, and reflect on uh, the Monreal ambush that happened 100 years ago uh, tomorrow. So, um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So just, just, just give me one moment.
Okay. All right, so uh, and hopefully all of you can see this now. So I'm actually going to start with an audio clip and I'm not going to give any introduction to this audio clip. I'm, I'm simply going to play it. And I'm very grateful to Tomas McInmara, Dr. Tomas McInmara, who has joined us um, all the, on the call tonight. And uh, Tomas McInmara is, of course, uh, one of the most respected historians in this area, uh, not just in Clare, but nationally. And he's done a huge amount of work in recording, in particular, oral history. And this is an example of the fantastic work that he has done. Um, and I've also made it clear to Declan that he's not to allow Tomas to speak at any stage tonight in case he contradicts anything that I've said, nor is he allowed to ask, ask any difficult questions. Uh, but uh, Tomas is absolutely fantastic uh, and has brought great insight and, and a wealth of knowledge to this area uh, and has been uh, just, I think, fantastic for uh, the memory of this area in County Clare and, of course, has written a number of books. So I'm going to play this audio clip and uh, then um, I'm not going to make any comment on it for the moment. But I know the time of the tenth, it was a, it was an awful time. God, you wouldn't know that the night they'd knock in the, the door and they'd come in and search your house. And if there was a spark of light seen, the windows had to be barricaded, covered up, no light to be seen. That by the Murphys we were talking of the last day, that was very sad. Wasn't it sitting down reading a book that he was when he was shot through the window? Oh, God, it took an awful effect on them, did. My father's health broke down that time. Oh, you'd be afraid of your life, sure. And the 10 or 12 lorries go from Ennis Diamond down to Ennis every morning. And they'd be banging shots at both sides. Oh, I remember the evening before we came in from school. I remember my father and mother, there wasn't a word out of them. And they didn't tell us anything. But we knew in the morning what was wrong. And we were all collected into one room. In case the, the daddy shots come through the windows or the doors. The stone walls were the safest. And my father had to go to see the cattle. And he was in his way back. And he went in shift from a shower and there was a bullet put through the tree where he was over his head. Oh my, it was a bad time. Okay, so that's Nora Canavan, uh, and she lived near Monreal. And the first part of that audio clip is her reflecting on what life was like in Clare around the time of the War of Independence and convoys travelling between Ennis Diamond and Ennis and the behaviour, I suppose, of the Black and Tans at that time, shooting indiscriminately as they passed. And that gives an indication of how very different life was for people in Clare 100 years ago to what we experience today. The second part of that video, of that audio clip, is her reflecting on the Monreal ambush itself. And so here we have a voice of somebody who remembers the event. And I think that's quite uh, poignant. And I suppose the terror as well that many ordinary people would have experienced being caught up in a conflict of this nature, um, which uh, was really quite devastating um, for the people of County Clare and for the people of Munster. And in researching topics like this, um, none of us, nobody on this call today was present at any of these events, and we have to do our best based on the evidence that we have. And the evidence that we have is mainly the eyewitness accounts of the people who are present. And I just want to make a couple of reflections about that. The first is there's the events themselves. And those events very often occurred 
in circumstances where the eyewitnesses were under high levels of stress. And as most people would be aware, eyewitness testimony regarding anything uh, is uh, open to human frailty. The second is the time frame very often between the events that they speak about and when the recollections are written down. And many of the main statements, if you like, that historians rely on were written in the 1950s. So a period of 35 years uh, after the events of which they are, they are recalling. So it's not surprising that we have inconsistencies with regard to many, many details between the individuals uh, who are recounting what occurred. The third factor that I just want to mention tonight, because I think it's one that very often gets lost uh, or that people aren't conscious of, and that is the Civil War. And people who are writing in the 1930s or writing in the 1950s about events that happened in 1919, 1920, 1921, are looking at those events through the lens of the Civil War. And even though they were very much brothers in arms in 1919 and 1920 and 1921, that changed radically uh, in uh, only a few months later. And many of those people, uh, you know, ended up on with very different views and ended up uh, in a very, very bitter conflict against each other. And in many cases, they harbored uh, very deep resentment and hatred uh, towards some of those former colleagues. And that can be reflected in some of the documents, it can be reflected in some of the accounts that are given. Uh, and in a very practical sense, it can mean that people who fought on the same side as them um, tend to have their contribution maybe expanded from what it was. And the opposite is also true that they will play down sometimes the contribution of others who may not have fought on that side or indeed may choose uh, not, not Paul, can you hear me? I think we've lost sound there. Back again? Uh, yeah. Apologies if that happens again, just let me know it's a bandwidth issue. So I could talk about just the ambush itself. Uh, the, what the plan was regarding the ambush and how it actually unfolded, and they would spend some time uh, on the on the aftermath. So, I want to talk about the Crown forces. During 1919 and during 19, the early part of 1920, the main target really of the IRA was the RIC. And it would be a mistake to confuse the RIC uh, or to see them as some form of precursor um, or um, uh, an earlier version of Angarda Siakana. They really were much more similar to a military force. And this was because the British had a policy towards Ireland of seeing the Irish problem as being a police issue. Um, and in reality, it wasn't. But this avoided them uh, having to admit that it was a war. Um, but the solution to this, of course, was to train the RIC and to arm them to the point at which they looked and felt very much like a military operation. During 1919 and the early part of 1920, there were a large number of raids against RIC barracks by the IRA and including in, in, in uh, all over Munster uh, seeking arms. And this resulted in the RIC adopting a, a, a strategy whereby they would withdraw to a small number of heavily fortified uh, barracks and they would concentrate the numbers there. So this resulted in a situation where you might have had 40 RIC men in Corrifin you had about 50 in, uh, in, uh, in a Steinman, um, and the, the, you had uh, other large barracks in Ballyvahan, uh, uh, in, um, uh, in Milton Malby, and also in Ennis. Um, and the RIC, many RIC members also resigned from the force during this period, and the rate of the resignation was outstripping the rate at which uh, the government could replace them from within the Irish population. So their solution to that uh, was to um, uh, 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 create two new forces. The first of these, uh, which will feature in our talk tonight, is the Black and Tans. Uh, the other was the Auxiliaries, which didn't feature in the Moan Real Ambush. 
But in case anyone was wondering what a black and tan looked like, this is one of them. Uh, well, someone dressed up as one. Uh, and they got the name, of course, from the fact that their uniform was supposed to be tan. They didn't have, um, uh, was, uh, they didn't have enough of that, and therefore they supplemented it with the uniform of the RIC. Um, which was not black as such, but a very dark green, and they had the RIC cap. Um, this particular one is carrying the uh, Lee Enfield rifle, which was the standard service rifle of, uh, of, the, of the Crown Forces. He also has the revolver, which was probably a Webley, uh, and he is also carrying a Lewis machine gun, which again featured at Mon Reel, and it was generally operated by two people. So as we can see, uh, the Black and Tans, uh, uh, and not just them as well, the RIC, were very heavily armed. So the Black and Tans arrived in Ireland in early in, uh, started arriving early in 1920, um, and they supplemented the RIC, RIC in Clare, and they supplemented them in particular for the purposes of tonight's talk uh, in, uh, in, uh, um, in Estimon. Now, the uh, police force, the RIC, the auxiliaries and the TANs were also supported by the British Army, of course, and the British Army um, uh, had a number of divisions in Ireland and Clare came under the 6th Division of the British Army. And a particular manifestation of the British Army that we had in Clare in late 1920 was the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Scots. They arrived uh, into Ireland um, in uh, July 1920 and they were posted to Ennis. Um, and Ennis was their headquarters, but uh, they also had detachments at various locations around the county, including Corrifin and including Ennis Diamond. And uh, there was uh, about 100 of them stationed at the workhouse um, in Ennis Diamond. So uh, this is a postcard from 1920, which shows an RSE man on the left uh, a black and tan, uh, this particular guy dressed in the proper uniform of tan, uh, the second from the left, uh, an auxiliary is the third guy uh, over. They were mainly officers, by the way, uh, they saw themselves as a more elite force, um, and the guy on the far right uh, is a veteran soldier. So as we can see, there were friendly, happy fellows, and um, not at all the murdering, uh, marauding uh, thugs that uh, we have made them out to be uh, in history. So the uh, RIC were, and the TANs were also very well equipped and very mobile. So we, here we can see a picture of RIC from the time. This is a Crosley tender, and this is exactly the type of model and the type of vehicle that they would have been uh, travelling in at Monreal. And as we can see, they're well armed again with the service rifle. Uh, the, uh, we can also see on, on the left, if you look just beside... Um, uh, it is an item here just between the driver and the guy in the middle and that is very clearly a rifle grenade uh, and this would have been used uh, at Monreal and we'll come to that in a few minutes and we can see this, that this chap on the right uh, has a Lewis machine gun um, again which was used at Monreal so this uh, gives a good picture of what an RSE uh, uh, Crosley tender uh, uh, might have looked like. So they were, of course, faced by the Irish Republican Army, and the Irish Republican Army uh, was divided into a number of brigades across Ireland, and they didn't have divisions at this stage. They came in later in the Civil War. And the typical structure, you had, of course, general headquarters, you had brigades in Clare with three brigades, the Mid Clare, the West Clare, and the East Clare brigades. At one point up to 1918, there was only one brigade in Clare, the Clare Brigade, but by now it had been divided into three each brigade would have had a number of battalions. This is just illustrative. So we had in, 19, in July, sorry, in December 1920, uh, uh, there were five battalions in Clare, uh, in Mid Clare Brigade area. That became six uh, from January uh, 1921. And under each battalion, you had a number of companies. So you would have A Company, B, C Company, etc. And a company usually reflected a, a parish. So in terms of numbers, typically your, your, uh, your average brigade might have had, well, I don't know if it's average, but the Midclare Brigade had 2,322 members on the, 20, on the 11th of July 1921, on the Day of the Truth. Um, and, your average battalion, uh, and your average battalion might have had uh, 350 or 400 uh, members. Your average company uh, would have had about 40 or 50 members, for instance. So the um, officers of the Midclare Brigade on the 11th of July 1921, and again, this date is used because um, this, the Irish government went to great lengths to capture in great detail uh, the, the structure and composition uh, of um, the IRA on two dates, the 11th of July 1921, and at the end of the Civil War. Um, so the brigade staff, uh, the OC was, of course, Frank Barrett, 
uh, from Dara. I'm not going to go through all of them clearly. Um, the third battalion was the battalion in which the parish of Corrifin uh, was located. Um, and there are a number of individuals here who will feature, of course, in our talk as we go on, in particular, uh, the likes of Andy O'Donoghue, uh, Sean McNamara, uh, and others. Uh, and many of these individuals participated in the Monreal ambush. Uh, from a Corrifin perspective, the name on that list of people who participated was, uh, was John Minahan. Um, so uh, again, uh, drilling a little bit deeper into the 3rd Battalion staff, the OC was Sean Casey from Rouen, and he was in charge of Section B um, in, uh, in Monreal, uh, and uh, possibly because it was happening in, in a technical sense within his battalion area. Uh, he, uh, and we'll come back to him in a few minutes, Vice OC was Pat O'Brien, the adjutant uh, was John Minahan, the quartermaster was Michael Hagerty, and the intelligence officer, and also at that time, special intelligence officer to the brigade, was also John Minahan. Um, the strength of the 3rd Battalion was 321 on the 11th of July 1921. And again, there are a number of companies, Kilnamona, Kilkidi, Rowan, Dyser, which I'm skipping over, just concentrating more on the, uh, on the um, uh, Akorafin one. So Ra had a strength of 49 uh, on that date. Um, and three members of the Ra company participated in Monreal. Now, they participated in a support role uh, because part of the modus operandi of the IRA for a, an ambush was to set up roadblocks as well. And so the roadblocks would have been set, to, set up to prevent or to slow down. It wouldn't have prevented, but it would have slowed down reinforcements from Ennis, Ennis Diamond and from Currafin. Um, so the people who were involved uh, were Captain Patrick Whelan from Moyhill, uh, John Kelleher, uh, who was the intelligence officer um, of E Company, and he was from FLAG, um, and Second Lieutenant um, uh, uh, Martin uh, Whelan, um, uh, who was from Kahaska. So we can see there Corrifin, uh, Patrick Kearse, who was the captain of Corrifin. Uh, his brother was Jimmy Kearse, who was also involved in Monreal. So there was only two Corrifin people involved in the actual combat at Monreal, John Minahan and Jimmy Kearse, who were first cousins as it is. Patrick Kearse uh, was his brother, captain of the Corrifin company. Patrick Kearse was also a member of the active service unit, but that was later. Uh, the adjutant of Corrifin was, uh, was Daniel Auckland, who was also my grand uncle. Quartermaster was uh, William uh, Maloney, uh, Thomas Quinn and John and Cunningham were the lieutenants. Kilnaboy then seems to have very few people here, but I think what happened in Kilnaboy was a number of the Kilnaboy people actually joined in uh, with, uh, with Kilfenora. So we Captain Thomas Collins, Quartermaster Martin O'Brien, Intelligence Officer um, uh, Martin McMahon, and First Lieutenant uh, Morgan Whelan. So the background to the Monreal ambush, getting to that uh, uh, event itself, um, there were really a couple of uh, events that led up to it. Uh, the IRA had decided, the leadership of the IRA in, in the Midclare Brigade area had decided to set up an active service unit as early as August 1920. Uh, and similar units had been set up around Ireland. And the objective was to concentrate in a, a highly mobile unit the, uh, and, uh, the firepower of the brigade so that they could take on the, uh, the, the British. Now, um, that decision was made in August, as I've said, but they weren't able to follow through for the simple rifles. And they had a, a adopted, um, or adapted, I should say, 12-bore uh, shotguns uh, in a way that was kind of unique to the Midclair Brigade, whereby they would melt wax into the, uh, into the buckshot and this would increase the range um, and uh, firepower of the of the shotgun, but that simply wasn't sufficient uh, if you intended to take on uh, heavily armed military. Um, so at Rouen Barracks, um, they on, in October uh, 20, 1920, they captured a very significant amount of arms and ammunition. And if people are interested in the uh, in the uh, statistics on this, they captured 15 Lee Enfield rifles and uh, the Lee Enfield, those Lee Enfield rifles, examples of those are in front of you in the picture. 14 revolvers, one automatic pistol, two very V or E Y light pistols, two shotguns. Uh, and thousands of rounds of ammunition. Um, and they also uh, captured a number of boxes of hand grenades, uh, rifle grenades, um, and other assorted ammunition. So this transformed the firepower of the Midclair Brigade. The, uh, the flying column was set up uh, in um, November of 1920 uh, under uh, Joe Barrett of uh, Dara. And uh, Immediately upon its establishment, uh, they underwent a training camp in very early December uh, near Kilfenora. And that training camp was overseen uh, by a chap by the name of, uh, of that's Joe Barrett, by the way, from Dara. 
we'll come back to him several times as we go through this evening. Um, so the, it, the Ukrainian camp was overseen by a chap by the name of Ignatius O'Neill. And Ignatius O'Neill uh, was the, up until a few weeks earlier, had been the OC of the 4th Battalion. Um, he had resigned uh, shortly after one of his greatest successes, which was uh, his command of uh, the, um, uh, the force that uh, uh, undertook the ambush at Renin, which was one of the most famous ambushes of the War of Independence in Ireland, let alone Clare. Um, and he resigned shortly after that, uh, after that ambush. Um, uh, it would appear there were some disagreements uh, with, with his superior officers, but I'm, I'm not going to speculate. Um, but he was extremely experienced in military matters. He had served with the British Army. So he oversaw the training camp and, he, uh, and together with a chap by the name of Martin Slattery, again, who we'll come back to. And um, John John Neelan of the 4th Battalion, who had been the vice commandant of the 4th Battalion and who, who, um, who also resigned, um, uh, stated that the brigade column which came together at that time uh, included practically the flower of mid Clare, men who had come together, many of whom had never met before and who were known to one another only by the reputations. Um, and so this was, I suppose, a, a new departure for uh, the officers of the mid Clare Brigade. And uh, there were about 30 of them in total. Most of them were people who were already on the run. Some of them had been on the run for a number of years, actually, at this stage. Others had gone on the run just shortly after Rouen uh, because they were suspected of involvement. And um, while they were on their training, while they were on their um, training program uh, in near Kilfenora, uh, intelligence came to them that uh, there was a regular convoy travelling between uh, uh, travelling between Ennis Diamond and Ennis, uh, comprising two lorry loads of uh, RIC tans and our military, and they considered attacking this convoy. And they decided to, to do so, even though a number of the people uh, present did have some misgivings. And it's implied by John Dronilan that the people who had misgivings may have included Joe Barrett himself. And the reason they had misgivings was because it, it wasn't, they weren't convinced that there was a location suitable along the road on which to undertake this ambush. But according to John Dronilan, there were two factors that really persuaded them to go ahead with the ambush. One was uh, Ignatius O'Neill himself. Uh, who became quite insistent on it. And given that he was more or less in charge of the training camp, may have wielded uh, a disproportionate amount of influence, even though he wasn't actually a commissioned officer, if you like, at the time. And uh, he, according to Neelan, threatened to resign um, and set up, or, or threatened to set up his own column if they didn't go ahead with the ambush. The second factor, according to uh, Neelan, uh, is that there was a desperate wish amongst the people. This was the, as was all of these senior officers, or many, many of whom were senior officers who come together that was really a desperate wish amongst them to do something big as big as what had been done in other counties such as Balnali or Kilmichael again and both of those events would have been quite uh, would have been quite recent so they decided to go ahead with the plan and uh, the, I, the place chosen for the ambush was at Monreal. Now, as it turns out, uh, Monreal is in its entirety, uh, Monreal, it's Monreal South is the town, and that, that in, in its entirety is within uh, the parish of Roa, uh, the parish of Ra, which is part of the wider parish of Corrifin. And the parish of Ra goes as far as the river that we're looking at here, the Kulnar River. Uh, it, it, it is a few hundred metres uh, in towards Ennis uh, and a few hundred metres as well past the ambush site, which, we'll, uh, which we can see off in the distance there, the, the bend in the road, if you like, a few hundred metres beyond that. So it ju just by happenstance, the entire area of the ambush uh, was within uh, the parish of, um, of Ra. So as I've said, there were some misgivings about this operation, uh, but they decided nonetheless uh, that they were going to uh, that they were going to proceed um, with it. And I was struck as well when we were looking at these images how fantastic the scenery actually is around uh, this part of Ireland, something that very often uh, we take for granted, but then of course we don't always get an opportunity necessarily to see it from this vantage point. So at the time of the ambush, many of these houses wouldn't have been here. These two, um, these two houses in the foreground would not have been here. In some of the pictures, we've removed them through the wonders of modern technology. The, amb the uh, third house in the distance, um, however, was there, uh, and uh, we're going to see that uh, that house featured to some extent uh, in, the events, in the events that uh, unfolded. So the um, the ambush site um, 
uh, was uh, in two parts, if you like. There was this is the exact site, if you like, of the killing zone, if you like, or the kill zone of the ambush. So this part side of the road that we're looking at here at the moment, for the purposes of this uh, talk, we're going to say is the east side of the road. And the, uh, the side at the other side of the road, if you like, that we're, that we're looking at to, to the right of the road as we're looking at it, um, is the west side of the road. Um, and uh, on the evening before the ambush, some of the officers of uh, the column were inspecting the ambush site uh, and deciding where they were going to, how they were going to deploy their, their men. Um, when they were surprised by two lorry loads of military who were coming from Ennis, and these were Royal Scots, and they obviously could recognise an IRA officer when they saw one of them. They immediately stopped their tenders, they dismounted, and they opened fire. Now, they, all of the IRA, IRA men got away, but a number of cattle were hit, actually. But the importance of that incident is it's very likely that that particular incident alerted uh, the uh, uh, Crown forces in Ennis Diamond uh, to the fact that something may have been afoot. Um, and it may have made them a little bit uh, more cautious. And that may have been borne out in some of the events that subsequently took place. Now, much of the site is unchanged. The uh, cattle shelters that you're looking at in front um, are essentially unchanged uh, from 1920. That small wall, that, that small road, if you like, that's going through those gates didn't exist at the time. There was a quarry near those gates. And in fact, you can see the back wall of the quarry, which is that white stone that you can see just beside the gate. So there's a quarry there, again, which is going to feature in a few minutes. And you can actually see the line of the old road, which would have traveled along by the wall on your left. So it, it would have been a much sharper bend in 1920, and the road would have been much more narrow. Um, and it was going around this high ground. Um, and again, that was relevant because uh, it, was a, it was necessary for the lorries uh, to slow down when they were rounding that bend, and was also quite blind as to what they were coming into once they had rounded the bend. And it, this was the reason why this site was chosen. So I want to just orient us a little bit further before I go on. And this is the entire ambush site. B is the cattle shelters that we were looking at just a minute ago. And this is where, so Joe Barrett divided his force into two sections, sections A and section B. Section B was positioned in that front cattle shelter. We'll see that in more detail in a minute. Section A was positioned in the field uh, west of the road um, and together with a command post. Where S is, they had positioned a number of scouts who were going to uh, uh, alert the men to when the uh, lorries were coming from Ennis Diamond. R is a point in the river where the men from A were going to withdraw through. And they were going to withdraw over this hill and uh, they were going to reassemble um, after the ambush where the W is in the foreground. The W in the, in, at, the, at the back of the picture, if you like, off in the distance, is, is the line of retreat. Um, of B, or the line of withdrawal of B. Uh, C, there was a cabin where C is, and again, this is going to feature in a few minutes. M indicates the Monana Bridge, um, which also featured in the ambush, and F is where two flankers were positioned by Section A, um, and uh, they were in that position uh, throughout the ambush. Uh, and the um, uh, objective of the flankers was to avoid uh, the um, uh, Section A from being outflanked, if you like, by people crossing that bridge um, and potentially cutting off their line of retreat. So Section B was under the command of uh, Commandant Sean Casey from Rowan. He was a school teacher. Um, he actually had to resign from his teaching position uh, ultimately because he had taken the Republican side in the, in the, uh, in the Civil War and emigrated to America, uh, where he lived for the rest of his life um, in Chicago. So he was in charge of B, and B positioned themselves along the north facing wall, where it's indicated in yellow, facing Ennis Diamond. And, uh, and the uh, part of the wall that was facing the road. And there were 18 people in total in Section B, about 12 of whom were within this cattle shelter. And the other four comprised the scouts and flankers that were, which I haven't indicated on the map, but flankers that were uh, further along the road to the, to, the, um, to, the, to the south. Where the circle is, there were two individuals uh, who were posted with, uh, with grenades. Um, and those individuals were volunteers uh, Patrick Powell of the 4th Battalion and Sean O'Callaghan um, of the 5th Battalion. 
Now, uh, there's a, a friend uh, of mine who has done a, a number of uh, Jenny Spencer Higgins. She's a very uh, talented uh, amateur artist and she has done a number of sketches which we'll be seeing as the night goes through. So this is her artist artistic uh, impression of uh, what the men of Section B uh, might have looked like um, uh, uh, where they're positioned. So I've put in some orange circles because in order that the men of Section B took a number of precautions. They decided that they needed a means of egress, uh, which was safe in the event of them having to do so. So uh, they um, created gaps in the rear wall of both shelters at those corners. And their plan of escape, if you like, or their, their plan of, of withdrawal was to go through those gaps without having to climb over the high walls, which might have exposed them to enemy fire, to um, uh, travel along the south uh, side of, of that device wall and to exit at the corner at the top corner of the field uh, and then to uh, to head um, across country if you like to the the relative safety of, of where we can see there's a lot of cover in the distance um, so this was a, a fateful move that proved very fortuitous um, as the ambush developed so section a was at the as i've said on the west side of the road um, and there was, through the wonders of modern technology, we have reproduced um, a low stone wall that was about two foot high that existed on this side of the, of the, wall, of the road. And it was the remains of an old cabin that had been in this location. Um, and uh, only two of those walls remained. So Joe Barrett positioned tw 12 men, uh, all of them with rifles, uh, in section A along this side of that wall. Uh, and there was a left and, and a right uh, of those men. And where P is was the command post, uh, and in the command post was uh, was Joe Barrett himself, uh, the column commander, uh, John Minehan, adjutant of the 3rd Battalion uh, and Special Intelligence Officer, uh, John Joe Nealon, ex-Vice Commandant of the 4th Battalion, and volunteer Martin Slattery of, of the of A Company by A 2nd Battalion, uh, again, as we've seen with extensive uh, British Army experience. And uh, the, the plan was, this graphic here also shows what the plan was. The plan was, first of all, that there were going to be two lorries. No lorry was going to be fired on until both lorries were within the fire zone. Where the box is indicates where lorry one was meant to be when it was fired on. And lorry, lorry one uh, uh, was meant to be fired on the, uh, the, the men to the right um, of that particular wall. Now, none of them has said it's men to the right of this wall, they're saying it was half of the men. Uh, but I believe for having visited the site that it was the, the men to the right who were intended to fire on that. Um, the men to the left of that wall were to fire on Larry 2 once it rounded the bend. And they were also to be fired on by the men in Section B who were on facing Ennis Diamond. So Section B were also in two parts, subsections, if you like, uh, an element facing the road who were to fire on lorry one, an element facing Innes Diamond who were to fire on lorry two, and again, A was divided into two as well. So that was the plan. Um, the, um, uh, that's just a, a graphic of, the, of what the command post might have looked like. So in the event, however, that is not exactly how things transpired. Because at 9.15, scouts uh, reported. Uh, now, the IRA were in position from about eight o'clock that morning, and it was a bitterly cold morning. And about a quarter past nine, uh, scouts reported that um, three lorries were on their way from Ennis Diamond, not two. And this immediately created problems for uh, the for Joe Barrett and for the, for the officers, because it now became clear that it was not going to be possible to bring both lorries within the fire zone at the same time. It's very possible uh, that, um, uh, and, and the other issue they had here was that the lorries were traveling about 365 meters apart, which was slightly further apart than what they had anticipated. And now it's likely that Joe Barrett would have signaled uh, that the lorries were to be allowed pass through and that no action would have taken place that day at all. Were it not for the fact that a warning, sorry, was not for the fact that a shot, an accidental shot, was fired by uh, by one of the men. Um, and jo John John Elam names this person as being Jimmy Lafferty, who was captain of that company, Doolan of the 5th Battalion. Uh, and the uh, it would appear that the um, shot went off by accident uh, while he was trying to get himself into a better firing position. Uh, and he was in section A, I believe, to the right of that wall, somewhere not far from the command post. Um, this, wa this shot was heard by the men in the first lorry. And uh, they, they didn't stop, but they did slow down. And when the lorry slowed down, the, the IRA men could hear it slowing down from the 
noise of the engine. And they believed that there was a very real risk um, that the uh, that they were going to, the British were going to stop and were actually going to were, were going to fire on the IRA themselves. So as a consequence, once the first lorry rounded the bend, going slower than what had been expected, all of Section A fired on that lorry. The lorry continued along until it got to the front wall of the cattle shelter when it was fired on by the men of Section B who were facing facing the road. Um, According to uh, most of the eyewitnesses, a number of those men fell out of the lorry um, and fell onto the road uh, injured. Uh, well, dead or injured, as I've said, but again, we'll come to the issue of casualties uh, later. Uh, a number of them fell out injured. Uh, the lorry was ordered to speed up. The driver was not hit. It sped up and it stopped at the, Mon at the Monana crossroads. So lorry two at this stage had also bound rounded the bend and that was fired on by the men of section B who were facing in the, in the direction of, of Ennis Diamond. Um, and so by now lorry two had also traveled as far as the quarry and uh, the driver of that lorry was hit. And as a consequence of this, the lorry came to a halt in front of the quarry. Now I'm certain that driver was hit because no driver in his right mind would have stopped a lorry uh, right in the middle of the kill zone of an ambush site. Um, so I'm pretty certain that driver uh, was hit. Um, the men of that lorry immediately dismounted. They took shelter under the lorry and in the uh, quarry. Uh, in the meantime, two uh, members of the first lorry, so the driver wasn't hit and two others weren't hit. Um, and those two individuals were um, immediately got out of the uh, of the lorry, um, and they set up a machine gun. Uh, they set up a machine gun position, um, and I believe that machine gun position to have been roughly where that circle is, which would have given them uh, a very good view um, of the uh, of section of section B. And in fact, we even know the names of those two men. There was Sergeant Clark and Private Black of the, of the Second Battalion Royal Scots, and they started to open fire immediately on the men in section. B. Lorry 2, uh, now it, I should point out that all of the occupants of the first lorry were military. All of the occupants of the second lorry were police, uh, a mix of RIC and black and tans. Um, and they uh, immediately opened fire with rifles and with rifle, grena and with rifle grenades um, on section B. And on, it was rifle fire towards section A, it was rifle grenades towards section B. And this is a depiction of a rifle grenade. And essentially they used rifle grenades um, with great effect. And I believe they used rifle grenades because they didn't really have much of a choice because if they were to use ordinary grenades in order to get them from that distance and over the high wall, they would have had to stand up uh, to throw the grenade, which wouldn't have been a great plan uh, in the context of you being in the middle of an ambush zone. Um, so they were able to propel the grenade uh, using this mechanism and get it behind the walls and to uh, hit the actual walls um, of the, uh, of the uh, cattle shelter occupied by Section B. In the meantime, the third lorry um, came to a halt right in front of that house, which did exist uh, back in 1920. And this lorry comprised a mix of RIC, uh, sorry, RIC, black and tans and military, and they divided in two. Um, and I believe that how they divided was the police, uh, the black and tans and the RIC moved, uh, advanced on section A, and the military advanced um, on section B. And so we're going to stick with section B for the moment. So they moved more or less in the direction of that arrow. And the problem here for section B was they were now under severe fire with uh, shrapnel and splinters from the walls um, engulfing the uh, front of the cattle shelter, whilst they were now also at risk of being outflanked uh, and their means of egress being uh, blocked off by the military that had uh, emerged from the third lorry. So they, the military set up a machine gun uh, in this field and they started to move the machine gun gradually forward, advancing on, advancing on the retreating um, IRA men of Section B. And um, uh, the, uh, this is just a video clip which shows uh, the direction in which uh, the Section B men withdrew. Um, and they would have gone through the two gaps in the wall, as, we've as I've indicated already with the circles that we saw earlier. They travelled up along the, the south side of this wall, uh, taking cover, cover um, in doing so, uh, travelled up to the, the corner of uh, uh, the field that we can see uh, just behind those, those trees. Uh, they came out at that corner, travelled down the bank um, and um, uh, started to move um, off in this direction. 
Now, all the time they're under uh, heavy machine gun fire from the post that we've seen earlier. Uh, they took their, their means of, of, of escape was to use the ground to their advantage. And there were a lot, I don't know whether this ground has been bulldozed or not in the meantime, but at the time we're told there were a lot of humps and hollows in the ground. They used those to their advantage. They went into hollows. Uh, some of them fired while others retreated. In the retreat, Sean McNamara of Ballyvahan, uh, who later became the OC of the 6th Battalion when that battalion was formed in 1921, was badly wounded in the thigh. And as a consequence, um, two of his colleagues, uh, Paddy Devitt, who was the acting vice OC of the 5th Battalion, and Joe Griffin, who was a volunteer of F Company, Doolan of the 5th Battalion, uh, were trying to assist him. And they got pinned down by machine gun fire in one of the hollows. Now, Andy O'Donoghue made a dash for it and joined them. Um, and they decided that McNamara and Griffin would make a dash for, uh, for cover uh, in the distance, um, while, o while O'Donoghue and Devitt covered their retreat. So O'Donoghue and Devitt um, uh, laid down heavy fire on the machine gun position. This plan succeeded. O'Donoghue then made a dash for, for, uh, for cover, uh, while Devitt covered him. And then O'Donoghue returned fire, allowing uh, Devitt to escape. The IRA continued to fire after the retreating IRA men, and unfortunately, a number of them ended up getting slightly lost in that they, they didn't withdraw in the direction in which it had been planned that they would. And these were Powell and Call Callaghan, um, who we've seen earlier were armed with grenades, and the two scouts who are only armed um, with shotguns. And they were heading in a different route towards um, Cahar uh, Shirkin. Uh, and the uh, British uh, started to train their guns uh, on them because they could get a better line of fire on them in the distance. Um, ironically, the many of the men of Section B were saved by the arrival of reinforcements, British reinforcements from Ennestimon, where two or three lorry loads of black and tans and police um, arrived. And um, they, um, sorry, this is, this is O'Donoghue now and, uh, and Devitt. Um, so uh, 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 reinforcements arrived from Ennestimon comprising RSC and Black and, and Black and Tans. And seeing figures in the distance, they opened fire on them. Um, and the people they opened fire on returned fire. And it took them several minutes before they found out that the police were firing on the military and vice versa. And according to O'Donoghue, um, they sustained a number of casualties in this, in this friend, friendly fire um, incident, if, if we can call it, if we can use the modern term. Um, but it had the effect, importantly for the IRA, of halting the Royal Scots' advance towards them. And it also prevented the reinforcements uh, from entering in any realistic sense uh, into the fighting of the day from an IRA perspective. And it prevented them from using uh, their motorised vehicles in order to be able to um, uh, cut off their, their uh, line of retreat by going to back roads, for instance. Um, so in the meantime, Section A was involved in an even more intense uh, gun battle because Section A by now was contending not just with um, some of the men from uh, Lorry 2 who were firing on them all of the, all of the time, but one Section B had, uh, had retreated and the remainder of that lorry also turned their attention to Section A. Uh, lorry 3, uh, the police from Lorry 3 moved into the field uh, to the west side of the road and they started to advance on Section A's uh, position and a gun battle ensued. Um, Barrett was concerned uh, that uh, ultimately it was a gun battle that they were going to lose uh, and he was concerned that they were going to be outflanked and he had no alternative uh, but to order, um, to order a retreat. Um, uh, so the plan was that the 12 men of, uh, of the main body of men in Section A, uh, plus John John Nealon, uh, were going to uh, withdraw, if you like, to our right as we're looking on the screen. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, this was the line of retreat, actually, they were going to head down uh, along by the field. Um, this, th the ground was much higher in those days. This field has been bulldozed since. Um, so it has been flattened out more than what it was. So it's more steep down here as well. But this is their exact line of retreat uh, along these hedges. Um, and they crossed the river um, exactly where the camera is indicating, uh, or the plan was they were going to they attempted to cross the river um, exactly at this point, more or less by going through where that fence is now um, and through, those, through where those bushes are. Um, and their plan from, um, from the beginning was that they were all going to rendezvous uh, ultimately at the far side of, uh, of the hill. But this proved more difficult to uh, implement than, than uh, what they had uh, than what they had hoped. 
Uh, Joe Barrett decided that three men were going to stay behind to fight a rear guard action to try to enable the others to uh, to make a withdrawal. Um, he chose uh, uh, John Minahan uh, and he also chose uh, Martin Slattery. Now, I don't have a picture of Martin Slattery, unfortunately, to show you, um, uh, but they remained in the command post and the command post offered quite a bit of protection to the men who were in it and it enabled them to lay down heavy fire um, on uh, both the advancing uh, men from uh, both lorries um, and uh, also um, uh, uh, towards a machine gun uh, that by now had, be, had positioned itself in the high ground that had been east of the road which had been vacated by the men of section B and that machine gun was able to target the retreating men of A um, so this withdrawal um, uh, proved to be costly for, uh, for the IRA as they attempted to cross uh, the river uh, and the machine gun in particular, uh, it would appear, uh, wasn't able to target the men in the command post again because they were in a fold, what's described as a fold in the ground, uh, which appeared to offer a lot of protection but was able to target the, uh, the withdrawing men. Matters got quite a bit worse when a body of, uh, of military succeeded in making their way along the road towards the Monana crossroads um, and uh, under behind the stone wall. And there was a cabin uh, where, where it's indicated now on high ground. And that is that ground actually is quite a bit higher than the rest of the uh, train when you when you visit it. So there was a stone cabin here which was disused. Uh, but the military, um, seven of them, uh, entered this cabin. Uh, they knocked out a hole in the side of the cabin. Um, they put the machine gun through it. They made a number of attempts to at bring the machine gun into action. Now, uh, had they done so, then they would have been able to target uh, clearly the, the uh, men of Section A who were, uh, who were withdrawing. Um, uh, this became a priority and what was happening was spotted by the men in the, uh, in the command post and they, uh, according to Joe Barrett, they opened accurate fire on that cabin. Uh, they prevented the machine gun from coming into operation on two occasions from the cabin. Um, uh, by now, uh, the uh, military uh, brought the machine gun out into the field, giving up on that plan. Uh, five of them were manning the machine gun at this stage. Uh, again, they attempted to bring it into operation, but were unable to do so again, owing to accurate fire uh, from, the, uh, from the rear guard. Um, and this just gives an indication of where the command post was and the view that they would have had. So it, this looks like a bit of a distance, but I just want to point out that the rifles that they had, which were modern Lee Enfield rifles, um, had uh, an absolute effective range um, of about 300 yards uh, and it, in the hands of a skilled marksman, which further had a total range of about three miles. Um, and um, a, a, you know, a skilled rifleman would, would be able to hit uh, a human target, um, a stationary human target without too much difficulty um, from, that, from that distance. So the, uh, a number of the, men, the IRA men by now, however, had been hit by the machine, not by this machine gun, but by, by the one that was east of the road. So Paddy O'Loughlin, 1st Lieutenant of A Company Kilfenora, 5th Battalion, volunteer Bill McNamara of E Company Ennis, 1st Battalion, and Bill Carroll, 2nd Company, um, uh, of the 2nd Battalion, rather. Now, Bill Carroll, interestingly, was, uh, up until uh, two months earlier, was, an, was a well-respected RIC man, but he is also the same individual who uh, was a, um, a, a very valuable informer to the IRA, to IRA intelligence. Um, and he had, uh, in fact, he was the person who, in fact, portrayed uh, Ruan Barracks and enabled the IRA to capture it. Uh, they took him hostage in inverted commas together with another uh, RIC man at that time. Um, and uh, ultimately, um, he wasn't hostage at all, of course. It was a ruse uh, in order to give him cover. And uh, he ultimately ended up joining with the IRA and ended up being injured here um, at Monreal. So... Uh, Eventually, all of eventually the um, uh, apologies. Eventually, uh, the twelve men did make it across the river. They took um, cover behind stones um, um, and small, um, small um, hollows, if you like, in the ground on, on the far side of the river, and they returned uh, fire uh, in across on the east side of the road uh, and into and into the men of the two lorries near Section A's position. 
uh, and this enabled uh, the rear guard to withdraw ultimately. Um, but even though we're going through this quite quickly, it's important to remember this ambush actually lasted over two hours in total duration, which was, an which was not the type of length of time that uh, any IRA man would have wanted to be involved in an ambush, which was supposed to be short and sweet and get out of there as quickly as possible. So this gunfight lasted for, uh, for over two hours. Um, so the, um, the IRA uh, escaped in this direction. Uh, they went up over that hill and ultimately the rendezvous, the rendezvous, if you like, where that W position here is on the bottom of the screen. By now, however, they realised that they had another problem, which was uh, the two flankers were now missing. They hadn't met them where uh, the plan was to meet, which was where that W position is. Um, and the two flankers in question, uh, one of them was from Corrifin, uh, which is Jimmy Kearse, I've mentioned him already, of A Company, volunteer Jimmy Kearse of A Company, Corrifin, um, and of 3rd Battalion, and Jack ha volunteer Jack Hassett, who was of F Company, Dura, of the 1st Battalion. And uh, uh, Joe Barrett uh, looked for volunteers to go search for them. Uh, all of the men volunteered, and ultimately he chose a body of six to do so. And they discovered uh, that... Uh, Jimmy Kearse and uh, Jack Hassett were actually uh, underneath uh, the Monana Bridge and the reason they were there was because Jack Hassett had been badly wounded in both legs. He wasn't able to travel very well. They attempted to cross the river. They were unable to do so. The British were closing in on them and uh, they Sorry, Paul, we've just lost audio there again. Still no sound. Apologies. You can hear me now? Yeah, no, I'm um, here. OK, so I'm going to go back a second if that's OK. So um, the two lads had taken uh, cover under the bridge because Jack Hassett was badly injured in both legs. So they couldn't cross the river um, and the British were closing in on them, military military tans and RIC. Um, and so the, um, the relief party had to act very quickly. Uh, they they adopted a, they uh, assumed a position in which they could hit the military. They don't tell us where it was, but I think it's reasonable to assume it's on the high ground, more or less, where I have RP for relief party indicated. They laid on extremely heavy fire on the British and forced them all the way back to the Manana Crossroads. At the same time, another number of IRA men helped them to extricate them from underneath the bridge. Uh, and it transpires that both Hassett and uh, Kearse um, had engaged in their own uh, gun battle with, uh, with the British um, and had prevented them from crossing the bridge and potentially cutting off the line of escape um, of uh, a section by crossing the bridge and travelling down that road, uh, which was uh, what the objective of placing the flankers there was in the first place. So, sorry, now one second. This isn't moving. Right. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip over this reasonably quickly because I'm just conscious of time. We're an hour into this already, but there were a number of IRA casualties. And we've gone through most of these um, already. Um, the wounded were treated by a number of doctors in the locality. Dr. Hillary, of course, um, uh, father of the future president of Ireland, Dr. Peterson of Liston Var, Dr. Hayes of Kilmaley. Uh, Kilmaley, uh, by the way, was a well-respected uh, area amongst IRA circles for people who are on the run. Um, the British gave a particular version of events which may or may not have been true, and I'm going to come down and decide that it probably wasn't true. So here's a quote from uh, County Inspector uh, Gelston. There was a serious ambush of police and military at Ennis Drive and Ennis Road at 10.30 a.m. on the 18th. The raiders were repulsed, uh, with at least four of them being wounded. Five soldiers, Creighton, Campbell, Black, Chambers and Bulger of the Royal Scots Regiment and one policeman, Constable W. J. McInerney, received slight wounds. Um, one of the reasons I'm doubting this is not just because it's contradicted by, um, uh, well, there's a couple of reasons I'm doubting it. Th th this slide indicates another reason, which is the County Inspector Gilston states that some houses and here wrecks were burned around the scene of the ambush. They appear to have been ignited by rifle fire, fire by the raiders to form a smoke screen to cover their retreat. The truth is that uh, the British forces, the Crown forces, took significant reprisals on the people of the area, including burning a very significant number of clay wrecks uh, and burning down people's homes. Um, so he was attempting to blame this on the IRA. So immediately uh, we can start to draw into question uh, the truthfulness of, of County Inspector uh, Gilston. Um, and importantly, Corporal uh, George Henry Roberts, who was the driver of the first lorry, 
he ended up marrying a local girl in Dennis Diamond and settling down. Um, and he states that in addition to the six men in my tender who were wounded, one black and tan sergeant driver, Dan McInerney, an Irishman, and another black and tan, the second tender, were also wounded. There was no casualty amongst the men. The third tender, although I was present when the wounded men were being put on the Larry Serenus, I did not see any dead man amongst the British troops, and I do not believe that in the subsequent fighting, which followed after the British forces dismounted from the tenders, they sustained any casualties. So the um, county inspector is giving us a figure of six, but whereas George Henry Roberts, by my counting, is giving us a figure of nine. So there's immediately a discrepancy there between... between and he... Uh, not, a lot of people feel that he's being... that. Roberts has been conclusive in this. I don't believe he is. He's simply telling what he saw. There is one other interesting uh, statement from Roberts, actually, where he says that um, the captain of the uh, of the convoy, who was a man by the name of Captain Hay, he's saying that he was travelled beside him. And when the ambush started, he's saying that uh, once they were, they were fired into at the quarry, that Hay, uh, that Hay threw himself off the tender, uh, not saying that Hay was injured or anything like that. And I'm just questioning that uh, in that... I'm just questioning whether uh, an experienced officer who had experience in the Great War would have genuinely gotten out of a tender in the middle of an ambush site uh, voluntarily. I think it is possible that he may have been wounded. Um, so there are some elements of uh, even of Robert's uh, statement that I think we just need to, to approach with an element of caution. Uh, he also says that the ambush was at 6.30 in the morning. Now, again, this is just, just some detail, uh, but whereas I think um, all of the IRA men are, are fairly sure uh, that, and including the additional inspector, it happened around 10 o'clock. Um, a statement from John Doneelan, he said as soon as the first lorry came around the bend, it was raked by fire from our side of the road. Most of the occupants were knocked out of action, but the driver was uninjured and drove the vehicle as far as the Monana crossroads where two soldiers with a machine gun got out. He also states the second lorry came under the position of the men and the cattle shelter and some of its passengers were also knocked out, but the majority of them were able to fight. I'm not able to give any details of the casualties, but I'm certain that most of the troops in the first lorry were knocked out. Andrew Donoghue, who's, uh, you know, accounts of these things, and not suggesting other people's aren't, but Andrew Donoghue's accounts are very convincing. Um, all the men in Section A opened fire on the first lorry as a sped past the cattle shelter came under our fire, but the driver was not hit, though several of his passengers toppled onto the roadside, either killed or wounded. The second lorry halted almost in front of the quarry. The driver of this lorry had been hit. The exchange of shots lasted for several minutes before the reinforcements realised that they were firing on their own men, the military. So this is the Black and Tans and RIC, who had advanced a short distance after us. There were some casualties, and it gave rise to a lot of bad feeling afterwards between the military and the police. Andrew O'Donoghue goes on to say, I'm certain, though, that in the first lorry, not many survived injury. And I also think that in the subsequent fighting, a number of the enemy were hit. Um, uh, controversially, Joe Barrett, of course, states that it subsequently transpired that all of the first lorry had been killed or wounded, and that most of the British losses, which amounted to 16 killed and 40 wounded, were numbered amongst its occupants. Now, I'm not going to give any comments here. I wasn't that one real as to what happened, but all I want to do is give you, a, I suppose, a flavour of what um, of what some of the uh, statements of the eyewitnesses uh, stated, and maybe you can draw your own conclusions. Uh, I don't believe the British version of events. Uh, you can't believe it because. Uh, even Robert's own version um, of what he saw with his own eyes exceeded the six that is referred to. What's more, um, you know, uh, these rifles were extremely powerful. Uh, they were hitting a reasonably large target, which were lorries of troops. A B section in particular were firing at them at almost point blank range. A number of the men of the column had British Army experience. Uh, I just think that the chances of there being more casualties than what have been accepted are, are quite high. And especially given that this, given that this was a, fire, a firefight, a gunfight that went on for over two hours. And that's before we even get to the possibility, the probability of casualties. Uh, according to Andrew Donoghue, uh, amongst the uh, the firefight that erupted between the military and the police themselves. So there were reprisals. Uh, I've only given a sample of this here. The reprisals were much more extensive than this. Now, these are, these are pound values in 1920. Um, so uh, you can multiply these quite significantly. Uh, people had their uh, furniture destroyed. People had houses burned. They had hay ricks and barns destroyed. A number of people were beaten up um, as well. Um, so the, there were reprisals, not as severe as happened in, in Renin, where people lost their lives, but nonetheless reprisals. And of course, 
course, in the aftermath of this, um, uh, no, it wasn't purely related to one wheel, but it was one of the significant contributory factors. Uh, Clare was pla placed under martial law uh, in January. Um, this is a, 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 a picture of the actual uh, martial law declaration uh, for Clare, uh, other counties as well, Waterford, Waterford City, Wexford and Kilkenny, also placed under martial law at the same time. Now, if it looks like as if somebody just took their mobile phone and took a picture off the screen on their computer because they weren't able to download this, that's exactly what happened. Happened. Um, and uh, I think what the most, one of the most important aspects, one of the most important consequences of the ambush at Monreal was the effect that it had on the feasibility of British rule in Ireland. And we have to understand the IRA were not out. This wasn't a war of attrition. This was an intelligence war, and it was a war whereby they were seeking to wear down uh, the feasibility of British rule. And I started off by talking about what the RIC had done in relation to withdrawing to some major barracks, major strongholds in a small number of locations around Clare or around Munster. It was critically important for them that they were able to maintain lines of communication and uh, that they were able to um, uh, transport troops and supplies between those uh, between those areas between those strongholds and Monreal ambush uh, really uh, um, uh, was a severe blow to the, their capacity to do so because they now knew that the Midcare Brigade had an active service unit which it hadn't had previously and they also knew that they were armed with modern rifles and grenades and uh, where prior to Monreal the British were perfectly happy to set off with two lorry loads of, of military and police after Monreal, the minimum number of lorries they would put on the road was six together with an armoured car. More usually it was 10 or 11, and we even saw that being referred to uh, by, um, uh, by the, um, uh, the young girl who had lived, uh, um, uh, Nora um, Canavan, who had lived near Monreal, uh, and uh, you know what that looked like. So 10 or 11 lorries together with armoured cars. And very often as well, uh, they would time trains to come through the same area loaded with troops. Um, it, 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 as a backup, just in case they were needed. So clearly, this type of this level of military intervention uh, in Clare and in Munster um, wasn't sustainable in the long run. So um, suffice it to say that Monreal had certainly played its part in full in undermining uh, British rule uh, on this island. Okay. So Declan, I might pass back over to you. I'll stop sharing. I'm just going to get it back up there now. So I've gone a little, little over time, but uh, I hope I'll be forgiven. Okay. Paul, um, thank you so much. That's such an extraordinary level of, of uh, presentation. And just wait for the sound to improve here. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, on behalf of everybody watching, Har Sáilia, Sáilia, Canada, Agus Aichinella, Timpel Nukrina, Agus Timpel Nukrina, Thank you so much. I mean, the, the, the history just comes out of you. It, it, it flows forward so well. That was an extraordinary level of research that you put in to your work there on the uh, Monary Lambush. Uh, your usage of uh, the drone clips, the, um, the video clips, the uh, just bringing us in. I, I, I actually feel that I've been part of the ambush. <laughs> I feel I've been really uh, through this tonight. Uh, and you, you, you've, you, thank you so much for your generosity in sharing uh, your, your knowledge and your extraordinary amount of research um, with us. Uh, Dr. Tomas McNamara, in, in, in an email there a few moments ago to me, put it so well. He said, remarkably well researched, considered and presented. Incredible effort and thought, Paul. Um, that was really, really good. Now, we, 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 we just we, maybe we'll take another uh, couple of minutes uh, because I did get a, a couple of questions in. Uh, one of them was clearly tongue in cheek because it asked, Was there any compensation for the cattle? I think we'll probably know the, know the answer to that. Um, were there 
better sites available to them uh, in relation to that ambush. And Paul, one other question, um, uh, and I think you, 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 you've dealt with it to, to in a certain extent, why was there so much uncertainty regarding the uh, number of casualties? Uh, so just those, those uh, three. Um, there probably were better sites, but those sites would have been closer to Ennis. And the Monreal ambush occurred on the back of the training uh, camp that was set up in Kilifenora. And the probability is that they wanted to choose a location that they were going to be able to get to yeah, as a unit straight from the training camp because they went from, they were built, if you like, around Kilfenor to training camp. They went from the training camp essentially to Monreal. So there may have been better sites, but they would have been closer to Ennis. Um, and there certainly wasn't another site further along that road for several miles that would have been, that would have been suitable. Now, there was, there was another problem, I suppose, with that site as well, uh, which was that it was, it was potentially too close to Ennis Diamond. Uh, because uh, it took a very short period of time for reinforcements to arrive from Ennis Diamond. Now, I didn't point out, and I should have, I suppose, that, that ultimately towards the end of the ambush, further reinforcements did arrive from Ennis. Uh, so a very significant British force had assembled at Monreal uh, by, uh, by noon of the 18th of, uh, of December 1920. Uh, the second question, sorry, Declan, remind me of the second question again. The uh, second question regarded compensation for the cattle, I but I, I think that was just tongue-in-cheek. Um, and then the, the question of the uncertainty regarding the uh, number of casualties. Yeah. And, and I think you've largely dealt with that. Well, well yeah, but um, the, it wasn't beyond the British to lie. Um, and they did do this in, with respect to a number of other engagements that they were involved in. Uh, they would have um, uh, played things down and it was in their interest to play it down. I think there are a number of theories that I could forward. There are nothing more than theories. Uh, they had suffered a very, very significant uh, reversal at Renin. The last thing they wanted was another reversal uh, or anything that looked like it. Now, I don't believe there were, I, do, I don't believe there were large numbers of casual, uh, large numbers of fatalities at Monreal. I think that would have been more difficult to cover up. But I certainly think they had significantly more casualties at Monreal than what they had. Um, so that's one reason. The second reason that it's a personal theory that I have, which is the 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 um, friendly fire incident between the, and this really has been skipped over by a number of people, and only Andy O'Donoghue speaks of it. If there was a friendly fire incident that lasted for several minutes that resulted in additional, additional casualties between the police and between the military, this would have added an, ad, an additional layer of embarrassment for the British. And I think they may well have decided uh, that they were going to adopt a particular, uh, a particular um, storyline on this, a particular editorial, and they were going to stick, they were going to stick with it. Uh, and even Roberts himself, and I think there are elements of Roberts' statement which I could pick holes in, uh, but I'm not, you know, again, I'm not implying that he, he wasn't been truthful. But at no stage does Robert, Roberts claim to know exactly how many casualties were. He says that he saw nine. He doesn't say that, the, he says that he doesn't believe there were further. But Roberts, Roberts actually, to, while the ambush was still going on, uh, Roberts, in fact, was sent off uh, driving a lorry with a number of military in it to, uh, to raid a number of houses. Um, so he wasn't there for all of the ambush, and he certainly didn't see what had happened at the other end down towards the cattle shelter, and he certainly wouldn't have seen any of the, of the friendly fire uh, incident. So there is nobody that we can kind of lean on as an eyewitness who would be able to attest uh, with any level of accuracy to absolutely everything that happened on that day, especially given the confusion that there would have been going on and the length of time that the ambush lasted. Paul, our muyachas er fadkud, tabide dridam er ur agus kaharu, and uh, again, uh, it's, it's, it, it will take us a long time to thank you <laughs> so much uh, because we owe you so much after that talk. Yeah. Um, just to, to, to mention one or two quick things, I have right behind me here the Cumann Amman flag. Uh, and it, it's something Cumann Stara Istukish want to do uh, shortly. We want to um, hold an event. Hopefully 2021 will, will bring us a better ability to, to, to hold events. Uh, but when we can, we want to honour uh, Common Amman and the role that women played in the War of Independence because we think it's huge. Now, just in conclusion, uh, I, I want to thank our, our technician, uh, Danica Kelleher, uh, who really uh, worked extremely hard to ensure uh, that this night went off successfully. Uh, Danica, Gerd Milamagat, their father. I want to also just to thank the local historians in the area. 
who inspire us all so much in our local our interest in local history. Uh, people like um, uh, like Dr. Thomas McNamara, like Michael McMahon, um, Colm Hayes, uh, Joe Umberkerjig, who has shared his time with us in Curriffin on a number of occasions, Pat Kirby, uh, and and lots lots more. Uh, Michael McMahon's book is up here behind me. Uh, two of Cross's books are, are right here as well, uh, and indeed Colm Hayes's. And we're so lucky to have people like that uh, who inspire us in our interest in um, uh, in uh, local history. Um, I also want to thank just our own officers, uh, Dr. Mac and McNamara, Rogine um, Nealon and Val Egan for their work. Uh, Nabalta Schlattvera, Joe Connell and Curriffin Tidy Towns for publicizing the event tonight for us. Uh, Claire FM and the Claire Champion, who also give us uh, terrific publicity. Uh, D2 Print, who, uh, help, who designed our commemorative posters that we have up in Curriffin uh, to highlight the 100th anniversary uh, of this event. I want to thank you all for participating. Uh, and uh, in particular, again, I, I want to thank so much uh, those of you who are out of the country, uh, but who have joined with us here tonight. Um, I can't say Slana Walia to you, Mark Tigan Gulshev Galer Sawalia, you're all at home already anyway. Uh, but I can say Nully Kana, Agus Avlin Fihen is Fivasha, Agus Gurmil Malga Perfad, Agus Slan is Banat, or Common Star is Dukish Korafina. And Declan, I want to get in a couple of thank yous myself as well. Uh, one is Pat Kirby specifically, actually, because he gave me some photographs right, that I used tonight. So Pat is fantastic for the photographs. But the other is yourself, Declan, uh, and oh, for, oh. for organising tonight and everyone in Common Star is Dukas Corifina, um, and for all the fantastic, tremendous work that you personally and others have done over the years to promote, I suppose, the fantastic historical legacy of Corifin and the area. And it's absolutely fantastic. And it is so important that you and I and everyone else on this call um, remember the sacrifices of those people 100 years ago. They didn't know when they went to Monreal uh, at half six, seven o'clock in the morning, they didn't know that they were going to be coming home at all. And they were prepared to do that if needs be, for the freedoms that we enjoy today. And it's important that we never forget that.